What do you know about the Second World War? How do you think people made sure they were safe? And what do you think it was like for people living through that time? Well, we're going to tell you a little bit about a very special place called the Victoria Tunnel. Let's have a little look around the Victoria Tunnel and find out a little bit about its history. The Victoria Tunnel opened in 1842 and was originally designed to be an underground wagonway, transporting coal from Spittletongue's Colliery to the River Tyne. It was in use for just 12 years and remained relatively unused for almost 100 years after that. However, when World War II broke out, People living in central Newcastle were in desperate need for a communal air raid shelter which would help protect them from airstrikes. The Victoria Tunnel seemed an ideal structure, being quite far underground and stretching two and a half miles across central Newcastle. After a few changes, like making sure the structure was safe, building additional entrances, fitting new lighting, furniture and special protective blast walls, the tunnel could help keep 8,000 people safe. Do you think it was comfortable spending time in the tunnel? Well, unfortunately, people living in Newcastle during the war had to prioritise safety over a comfortable night's sleep. Can you think of any other ways that someone your age could stay safe during the war? And now, we're going to hand over to one of our Victoria Tunnel Guides, who's going to tell you more about why the tunnel was built, and share some more stories about how World War II affected people in the North East, Newcastle in particular. Take it away, Pete! The Victoria Tunnel is a 19th century wagonway which transported coal from Leeser's main colliery to the Tyne River. It served as a crucial resource in Newcastle's coal mining trade. In the 20th century, the tunnel was converted into a much-needed communal air raid shelter, protecting thousands of people during the Second World War. The Grade II structure, named after Queen Victoria herself, stretches two and a half miles from the Spittle Tongues area of Newcastle down to the River Tyne, running right underneath the city centre. Some of you may have walked through Newcastle's Haymarket, not realising the tunnel was underneath your feet. Today we'll be exploring the stretch of the Victoria Tunnel, which runs underneath Ousburn Valley, the south end. The majority of the Victoria Tunnel in the North End isn't accessible to the public for safety reasons. You can see the walls of the North End of the tunnel are thick with coal dust after almost 200 years. There are also plenty of World War II artefacts lying around and echoes of the air raid shelter are clearly visible. If you look carefully, many walls are covered with graffiti. Big clusters can be found in areas where they would once be seating, indicating people spent many hours filling their time with these creative endeavours. So let's rewind back and look at how we got here. Victoria Tunnel's origin began in 1835 with the opening of Leeser's main colliery and spit of tongues by two gentlemen hoping to make their fortune, Mr Porter and Mr Latimer. Initially, the Leeser's main colliery coal was transported to the Tyne on wooden carts trundling through the streets of Newcastle, but that was expensive for the owners and unpopular with residents. Porter and Latimer turned to a local engineer, William Gillespie, to design a wagonway. The structure was just one long tunnel with an opening at each end. The original tunnel structure was 7 foot 5 inches high and 6 foot 3 inches wide. 
clay extracted during the digging process was taken to the surface and made into 2.2 million bricks, which later lined the tunnel. The tough stone floor was built to handle the weight of heavy coal carts, which flew along the Stevenson Gage railway line. Before we dive into the tunnel, let's talk a little more about why it was so important early on. The Great Northern Coalfield, with Newcastle and the River Tyne at its heart, is often regarded as the driving force to the Industrial Revolution in this country. By 1860, the Tyne was the second most important river in the country, the Thames being the first. Staves lined both sides of the river and hundreds of sailing ships sailed daily, taking coal and other manufactured goods to locations all over the country as well as further afield. Coal mining was a lucrative business for the owners, hence Porter and Latimer opening the Lees' main colliery and building the Victoria Tunnel. Almost 100 years later, during World War II, the Victoria Tunnel came into its own again as a communal air raid shelter for between 8 and 10,000 people. Structural changes had to be made to add entrances, lighting, furniture, and various features to make it a safe haven to shelter from the Luftwaffe. The tunnel has lived on in the history of Newcastle, often very quietly. Despite its significance in the local history and industry, not everyone knows it's still here. Preparations for war began long before the war was declared on the 3rd of September 1939. There was a major fear that the German Air Force would bomb British cities and that many civilian lives would be lost. The government ordered a million coffins just in case. Everyone had seen the devastation the Luftwaffe had brought to the town of Guernica in 1936 during the Spanish Civil War. The government also feared poison gas bombs would be used. So, a contract to make 38 million gas masks was awarded to a Lancashire firm in 1938. The Air Raid Warden Service was created in 1937 and by 1938 had 200,000 members nationwide. By September 1939, the name had changed to the Air Raid Precaution Service, ARP service, and membership rose to 1.5 million. Provision was also made for personal Air Raid shelters in the form of Anderson and Morrison shelters. To tell you a little bit more about that, we've got a very special guest who can recount his own experience. Oh, my name's Basil, Basil McLeod. When the war broke out, I was 10 years old. The only people who could have an Anderson shelter are those with houses that had a garden. Mm -hmm. Where you dug a hole in the garden, about six feet or so, and put corrugated iron over the top and the soil that came out of the hole on top of the corrugated iron. Uh, but unless you had a, um, a house with, with a garden, this was not possible. The government supplied the, um, the corrugated iron and they give you a, a little sheet with instructions of how to erect it, but after that it's up to you. <laughs> In any case, um, there weren't particularly pleasant places to go because the ground was always wet and uh, there's also living uh, creatures in the soil and uh, they, they will get into the shelter. They were permanently wet and cold. And I don't think many people used Anderson shelters unless they had to. Uh, if uh, an every warning sounded, 
uh, and nothing particularly was happening, people would stay in the house. But once they would hear aeroplanes or gunfire going off, they would probably go into the shelter then. I never heard a good word about them anyway. <laughs> The other type of shelter that was uh, prevailing was uh, Morrison Shelter, uh, named after Herbie Morrison uh, in the coalition wartime government. You had to have a ground floor house. Uh, you couldn't, a lot of houses in Newcastle, uh, particularly working class areas, uh, were tenements. And uh, these shelters were so heavy you couldn't put one on the second or third floor, otherwise it just collapse. Uh, th these were all right. Uh, you could put a mattress in and you could sleep in it and you're in the house and you're all warm. Um, and if the house uh, collapsed, uh, you were safe. You, you might get choked with dust and so forth and you'd have to be dug out, but you wouldn't be killed or you wouldn't be hurt. Uh, they were quite good, but again, you had to have the right sort of accommodation before you could get into one of these. The other shelters we had was in streets which were not heavily trafficked with traffic. We had brick shelters, which was a square brick with a railroad's concrete roof, and these were these were all right. They were cold in winter time. They were dark, you had to light them yourself by candles, uh, but they would keep you safe. But these shelters were of little use to the civilians in the Usburn and surrounding areas, as they had no gardens and cramped houses. Communal shelters were needed. As early as 1936, various existing underground spaces were investigated, from basements and disused mines to places like the Victoria Tunnel. After decades of neglect, the tunnel walls were still thick with coal dust, which you can still see remains of today. Walls had partially collapsed in a few places, but it still appeared to be a good option, being very close to the city centre, and most of it being more than 40 foot underground. On the 12th of February 1939, a report was made that the tunnel, after cleaning out and shutting off of sewage gases, could be used as a shelter, but that additional entrances would have to be provided. The initial cost of the work was estimated to be £9,650, providing shelter for between eight and 10,000 people. It was proposed to add 18 entrances, but the costs escalated to £39,000, with only seven completed. So what was it like spending time in the tunnel when the sirens went off? There would be a rush to the nearest entrance, usually at night during the blackout. Children in hand, often carrying belongings that were too precious to lose if your house was bombed. First, it was great to be up after after midnight. For boys and you know young girls, it was quite a quite a social event to get out of the tunnel. And of course, it had to go on for an hour after midnight before you uh, you didn't go to school then. But if it stopped before midnight, you had to go to school. But we used to um, you know uh, buck the system a bit. You know, so it would would uh, plead ignorance and say, oh. We didn't come in because it was near it. The area, the area didn't go on till after midnight. <laughs> You'd rush to get a bench space for your family, or if you are very lucky, a bunk. It's believed the bottom bunk was reserved for people who contributed directly to the war effort. The middle bunk was for pregnant women or nursing mothers, and the top bunk was left for kids. But that didn't always work in Biker. The tunnel was divided into sections and families would often pre-agree to meet at a particular section marked on the wall. 
Electric lighting was dim, only 14 watts, and power cuts were frequent. Some walls were lime washed to help reflect the light there was, and to help prevent the spread of coughs and colds. There were toilet facilities, you can still see the markings in the ground. That's where the Elsan chemical toilets would be. Elsan chemical toilets, well, they were basically buckets with a seat. The chemicals inside were very strong smelling, as were the human contributions. And you didn't get much privacy. The best you could hope for was a curtain to save your modesty. After each air raid, it was the job of the tunnel wardens to carry the toilets up to the surface, empty and clean them out, add more chemicals and take them back down to the tunnel. Or betide if they dropped them on the way. You, you were worried, you know, uh, because you didn't know what was happening above you, you know. Well, there was plenty going on. When the air raids and that, he dropped the one at the top of our street, um, Steenberg's, on the, the quay side. Anyhow, we got through it, didn't we? Someone used to t uh, always say, that, oh, the old clear's gone. And that, and that was that. We just took it there at heart. <laughs> and there was no warning to tell you that the, uh, the air raid was over. And it just depended upon men, husbands and that, who usually stood at the mouth of the, at the, at the tunnel at the entrance and watched it all happen, you know. And then when the, the site the all clear went, they'd come down, come running down, all clear, all clear, and they'd run along the tunnel shouting, all clear, so, you know, people were going to, going to, going to be sitting there all night, <laughs> like, you know, shivering. <laughs> And when you, when you eventually came out, you, you sort of stood at the entrance and looked around to make sure that everything was all right before you come out and that, you know. And you could hear the sirens, the, the all clear going. <laughs>